the impossible really isn't that impossible. As we've seen already, that's a question people have been considering for years and years and years, even as far back as the people in the Bible. So let's see if they have something to teach us about having confidence in the face of what seems truly impossible. To do that, we head to the Old Testament of our Bibles during a time when the nation of Israel was ruled by kings. Now, some of these kings were really good kings. Think like David and Hezekiah. Sadly, though, many of the kings who ruled Israel were not so good. In fact, they were downright wicked. And there may not have been a more wicked king than the one who will show up in our story today. His name was Ahab. One of Ahab's biggest yet most wicked accomplishments was building a temple in Israel. You might be thinking, well, I mean, that, that didn't sound all that bad. Weren't temples where people worshiped God back then? Yes, you're right. But here's the problem. The temple he built was not for God, not for the one true God. It was for a false God named Baal, a God that the Canaanites worshiped. Ahab was making it easier for people to worship the wrong God. Like I said, this guy was trouble with a capital T. Sadly though, like many of the other bad kings, the people were more than willing to follow the king and what he said rather than follow God and what God said. Now there was another guy we should mention before we check out the whole story. His name was Elijah, and Elijah was a prophet of God. Now we often hear the word prophet and think that that means they were these special people with the ability to see to the future, like they were huddled over a crystal ball or something. And it's true that they told about what would happen one day, but even more than that, a prophet was somebody God sent to tell the truth about what was happening right then. They were like messengers, delivering God's word to people who really needed to hear the truth. And can you guess who needed to hear the truth? That's right, King Ahab. Ahab needed to hear the truth that God did not like how he was leading God's people. So let's just say that Elijah and Ahab had a little... FaceTime. Not that kind of FaceTime. I just mean they met face to face. You can imagine how this might have gone. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you? You were always stirring up trouble in Israel. I haven't made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have turned away from the Lord's commands. You have followed gods that are named Baal. See, Elijah told Ahab the truth because that's what a prophet did. But now it was time for a showdown. Elijah told Ahab to have all of the people of Israel meet on Mount Carmel. And I know what you might be thinking, but this is not the local ice cream shop. This was a mountain that you could see for miles around. Elijah also told Ahab to bring the prophets who worked for Baal and Asherah, who was like the female version of Baal. There were 850 prophets to these gods. That number alone can show us just how much of a problem Baal worship was in Israel and why God took it all so seriously. Something else you should know, Elijah was alone. Well, not really. God was with him and a few people did still follow the true God, but he sure felt like he was alone. He actually said this just before the showdown. I'm the last prophet, prophet of God left. He wasn't really, but... I'm sure it was hard to hit for him to feel very confident heading up to Mount Carmel, seeing those 850 false prophets, feeling like he was by himself. From the outside, this sure looked like an impossible situation. But let's stick with it and find out. So Elijah and the prophets of Baal gathered at Mount Carmel along with the people of Israel. And Elijah stepped forward and challenged the people. Elijah went there and stood in front of the people. He said, how long will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is the one and only God, worship him. But if Baal is the one and only God, worship him. The people weren't convinced though. It was time for a little head-to-head -head battle. And it may seem like this was Elijah versus Ahab, but it was really God versus Baal. But what kind of showdown could you possibly have between God and Baal? I mean, Elijah set the challenge before Ahab. They would each take a bull, cut it into pieces, and place it on the altar. This might seem strange to us, but this was actually a pretty common thing in that day. They regularly offered sacrifices like this to God. These were often burnt offerings, meaning there was fire involved. So what, you, what would you expect them to do after they placed the bull on the altar? 
Right, they set it on fire. That's what you would expect, but not this time. Check it out. Then let them put it on the wood, but don't let them set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bowl. I'll put it on the wood, but I won't set fire to it. Then you pray to your God, and I'll pray to the Lord. The God who answers by sending fire down is the one and only God. Now, before we go on, let me ask a question. Why fire? I mean, why did the challenge involve lightning and fire? Because like I mentioned earlier, fire was the way sacrifices were consumed. People arranged altars and lit offerings on fire to gods, but this time was different. This time, the people weren't going to light the fire on the altar. A fire starting out of nowhere would be a sign that a god was showing up. So Elijah's challenge was this, let's call on our gods and we'll see which god shows up. The prophets of Baal went first. They chose their bull, prepared it, and placed it on the altar. <laughs> Boom. The prophets of Baal started to pray from morning until noon. No fire, no Baal. So they tried another approach. They prayed to Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there wasn't any reply. No one answered. Then they danced around the altar they had made. Elijah even started taunting them a bit. Dance more, shout louder. Maybe Baal can't hear you. How long did this go on for? Until late in the afternoon, hours and hours of calling for Baal. Let's just say that Baal never picked up the phone. So now it was Elijah's turn, or should I say God's turn. Elijah stepped up and prepared his altar. He placed a bull on it, but then Elijah did something a little strange. He dug a really big ditch around his altar and then had some people fill four large jars of water. Not only that, Elijah had them pour water on the wood of his altar. He then had, he had them do it two more times. That's right, they poured 12 large jars of water onto the wood to the point that the water filled the ditch around the altar too. Have you ever tried to start a fire with wet wood? It's almost tough, maybe impossible. So what in the world was Elijah doing? Yes, Elijah was making the situation basically impossible. Lighting a fire with soaking wet wood from 12 large water jars, no way. But if the fire started, if this actually happened, it could only be God. No tricks, no stunts, only God doing the impossible. So Elijah stepped up, no shouting, no dancing. He just prayed a simple prayer. He prayed, Lord, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Today, let everyone know that you are God in Israel. Let them know I'm your servant. Let them know I've done all these things because you commanded me to. Answer me, Lord, answer me. Then these people will know that you are the one and only God. They'll know that you are turning their hearts back to you again. So, we have any guesses what happened? God showed up, big time. Right away, the fire came down, burned up the entire altar. The fire even dried up all of the water in the ditch. So I wonder how everyone reacted. All the people saw it. Then they fell down flat with their faces toward the ground. They cried out, the Lord is the one and only God. The Lord is the one and only God. So God did what seemed impossible. Once and for all, everyone in Israel knew that God was the one true God that they should follow. Okay, so most of us won't find ourselves on the top of a mountain in a showdown with 850 false prophets. And we're probably not asking God to rain down fire from heaven to light a soaking wet altar. But you know, we will face times when we find ourselves in situations that seem pretty impossible. We'll wonder if God will still show up, or if God can even help us. Maybe your family's in a bad situation right now, with maybe like a job or a health issue, and, and it seems like a pretty impossible place for God to show up. But what if you could be confident that God is still with you? Or maybe you're in a bad spot with a friend right now, and it doesn't seem like it's gonna get any better. But what if there's still a way for God to work in that relationship? Now, I should really say that not every impossible situation will go the way we want it. God brings situations into our lives that we don't always understand. 
but God can give you peace while you go through it. This is the peace that Jesus came to bring. Even feeling at peace with a situation might feel impossible. But the peace Jesus gives defies what's impossible. His peace reminds us that, just like Elijah, we're never, ever alone. So, as we wrap up, I want you to think about this question. What seems impossible to you? What's something in your life that it'd be really great if God showed up in a powerful way? Honestly, even small things we face can feel impossible sometimes. But always remember, we all face impossible situations. But no matter what, you're never alone. God is always with you.